following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. We are going to explain today the bodhicitta according with the Gospels, with the Bible, since we always state that Buddhism and Christianity complement each other. In order to go deep into Christianity, we have to go into Kabbalah. <coughs> Since Kabbalah is a root, the source of uh, Christianity. And for that, we always have to go into the Hebrew language, which in this case is a language that explains the Old and New Testament since Jesus and his disciples were rabbis or Jews, masters, Kabbalists that uh, delivered the doctrine in that uh, way. In Buddhism, obviously, we often utilize Sanskrit and other Asian languages in order to explain the same. When we arrive at this uh, bodhicitta, we uh, arrive at the Sephira Yesod. In this lecture, we are going to continue the extension of the explanation that we gave in Malkut related with the epiphany of Christ, which is a manifestation of Chokmah, the manifestation of wisdom or what in Kabbalah is called uh, Chokmah, the manifestation of that uh, force, which is Christ in the Sattva. Before entering into the Bodhisattva, as we stated previously, we had to go into the Bodhicitta, which is, of course, Buddhist term. 
body in synthesis is wisdom. In chitta, mind. In other terms, we will say nous. N O U S, nous. That mind, which is abstract, related, of course, with uh, Chokhmah. Remember that this great Kabbalist, Paul of Tarsus, in the Gospel, states, we have the mind of the Lord. To have the mind of the Lord is to have that chitta the bodhicitta, which in the Bible is symbolized by Elijah or Eliel in Hebrew. We are not going to explain about Elijah or the prophets, but we are going to go directly into our psyche. Because every personage that you find, whether in Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, is always a symbol, even though the personage existed but symbolizes something within our psyche, within ourselves. And that's precisely the point in the Gospels. Elijah, the prophet, symbolizes <coughs> the forces of the solar energy that we have to manage. Remember that uh, in uh, Greek, Elijah, Eliao, is Elios, the sun, the solar force. So when we refer to Elijah or Eliao, we are referring to Helios, the sun, which is not a person, but we are referring directly to the solar energy that we have to learn. We have to learn how to handle it, how to manage it in our body. If I am emphasizing in Elijah or Eliao, it is because in the Gospels and also in the Old Testament, it is written that it is necessary for Elijah to come before the Messiah. So the Messiah is the Bodhisattva. And of course, Elijah is the bodhicitta. This Elijah represents the solar mind completely developed. The solar mind that is utilized by the spirit. Remember that we stated in other lectures that the mantra, the Hebrew mantra, in order to be in touch with Keter, the first sephira, is Ja. Here you find that uh, famous word from the Hebrew language, Hallelujah. And many other names of the Hebrew language which point always to Keter, Ja. Among the prophets, Saharayah, Isaiah, etc. And of course, Elijah. This name means 
My God is Jah. Which in Hebrew is Eliyahu. Which if you observed, if you notice, El is God. And after that we have Yao. Which of course represents the first triangle of the tree of life. Keter, Chokmah, Binah, which in Christianity is called the Holy Tree Unity or Trinity. So this Jah, or Yao, of course, represents the three primary forces that express themselves through the solar energy, the solar force. That is, of course, Helios. That's why when we refer to Christ, as you know already, we always refer to the solar force. Because Christ is not a person, but an energy. It can transform anyone. But in the beginning, this Christ, this solar force, expresses itself as Yao, as Elijah, Eliao. That must come uh, first into our psyche. This solar light is placed on the fifth dimension in the atmosphere of the planet, in any planet. This is what uh, many Kabbalists call. Uh, the dragon, the heavenly dragon, the astral light, Inri. In uh, Kabbalah, esotericism, we know that there is a being that uh, controls the astral light, and is related with the planet Venus, or better say, with a positive ray of the planet Venus. And this is uh, Angel Hanael, Hanael. Hana means gracious in Hebrew, and El is God. So this uh, Hanael is the same Eros of, uh, the, of Greek mythology. Cupid, the forces of the astral light that coagulate in the sexual force, in the world of Yesod. That's why Anael is the angel of love. His opposite is Lilith, the counterpart, which is related with hatred, lust, and all perversion of sexuality. So here you find But in order for us to go and to be in direct contact with the solar light, with the astral light, we have to know the mysteries of love. And this is precisely the point here, because the mysteries of love, the sexual force, are related with the sephira yesod. Are related with the Sephira Yesod, which is Eden, which is precisely the fourth dimension where we find the two mysterious trees which are written in the book of Genesis, which is a book of alchemy, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. 
So the tree of knowledge is a, the tree of the signs of good and evil. Which, of course, is related with the gospel of Matthew. Matthew wrote the gospel according to signs. Of course, we're talking here about the superlative signs of the being, which we have to develop. We have to study it. The signs of good and evil is nothing else than the tree of knowledge or the way in which we had to manage the sexual energy. As the speaker uh, in the previous lecture explained, Tantra, or Tantrism. So, this tree of science, or tree of knowledge, is symbolized in the Caduceus of Mercury, which in this day and age is utilized in order to symbolize the science of medicine. That is in relation, of course, with our sexual force. If you observe here the tree of life, you find that knowledge, gnosis, is written as that. Below the tree, Niti, or the three primary forces, located exactly at the throat of the imaginary man that you see there. And the roots of the tree of knowledge are, of course, in Yesod. So from Yesod, which symbolizes the sexual glands, whether in the man or in the woman, we have the two polarities of the tree of knowledge, which is Adam and Eve, or yin and yang, all in all, the two polarities of the sexual force that always are divided in the world of Yesod. Since the world of Yesad is in the fourth dimension, it is directly related with the vital body. Remember that the superior part of the physical body is called vital body. But this vital body, or the life, the foundation, life foundation of the physical body, is precisely the sexual organs related with the four dimension, the ethereal body. From this uh, polarity, Adam and Eve emerges the physical body. If you observe and study the Bible, you find that uh, Chava, Eve is the mother of the living. It is refer a reference to the sexual force, the sexual organs, from which we or all this physical world emerges. This is why, Kabbalistically, alchemically, it is stated that we are children of Adam and Eve. It is true is we understand that Adam and Eve symbolizes the two testicles or the two ovaries, or the two polarities. Then, when we unite these two polarities, Adam and Eve, in the sexual act, then we find that the creation of Malkut is the outcome of it. This is what commonly anybody knows. Our physical body is the outcome of Adam and Eve, is the outcome of the union of the sexual organs of our father and mother, symbolically speaking. 
this physical body develops within the womb of our mother. That uh, womb represents, of course, the same Eden, the fourth dimension. And it's precisely there when that particle of the soul, that in Buddhism is called Buddhata, descends. In the very moment when the sperm enters into the ovum. In the very moment when Adam and Eve are knowing each other. As the Bible explains. So the Buddhata is that gracious part of the being which comes from above. Come from the macrocosmos. That is what we can call Hanael, or the part of God that descends. Hana, the gracious part of God entering into that body. And from that element that enters into the body is how the tree of life develops. Because it is the monad, the spirit, El, in Hebrew, the one that controls the development of that body into the womb of our mother. And that's why it is symbolically speaking, or written in the gospel, Luke, which is ready with the earth, the gospel of the earth, how Elizabeth, which symbolizes the monad, had in, in her womb a child, which is John the Baptist, which is going to be the bodhicitta, according to Christianity, that will prepare the way of the Lord, which is the reincarnation of Elijah. But we have to study this very carefully in order to comprehend, in order to understand in, a, in us. Because this is what is important. Those masters came in the past, yes. But they came and delivered the message, delivered their mission, that's it. Now we have to do what they taught us. When the physical body is done, created in the womb of our mother, comes out, and then you have an outcome, a life, which has its roots in the spinal column. So this physical body has its roots in the spinal medulla. From there, emanates all the systems, nervous systems, that will control the whole body as you know. So that's why the tree of life emerges from the roots also of the tree of knowledge. We said that both trees complement each other. We cannot talk about the tree of life without talking about the tree of knowledge. Because they share the roots in Yesod, which is the foundation. So, of course, you know already that the development of the physical body depends on the sexual force that also develops in our sexual glands during different periods of time. That is already explained in you know, the lectures. So, when we know the science of good and evil, the science of the tree of knowledge, then we want to develop this <coughs> essence, this Buddha, which we have within, that is the Buddhata, the essence. Because that's the purpose of giving us this physical body in order to develop the whole of the bodies related 
with the tree of life that are symbolized with the ten sephirah. So, of course, we need to know the signs of transmutation. Because without the signs of transmutation, we cannot develop the bodhicitta. We cannot develop that John the Baptist. Because here in this sephira is where we find the mystery of baptism. Yesod is related with the waters of baptism. Many religions celebrate that symbolic baptism in different ways, always with water. But when they have already their body with the energies, with the forces circulating in it, they don't practice that transmutation or that baptism, which symbolically was experienced uh, in their given religion. In the Ijesad, we find that John the Baptist appears related with the Gospel of Matthew, teaching the signs of the tree of knowledge. When you see that he appears and baptizing in the Jordan, it is a symbolic way in order to tell us that he is delivering the knowledge, the doctrine of the sexual transmutation of the Sahamai Tuna to humanity. He's baptizing with waters. He's delivering the knowledge, but those waters, of course, are inside of everybody, in the sexual energy of everybody. Behold here this name, because it is written that John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah. If you understand that Elijah symbolizes Elias, the solar force, and that, that solar force enters to the astral atmosphere, into the earth, and then into our organism through what we eat, breathe, drink, etc. Because that astral force, that solar light is everywhere in the four elements. So then you find The Jah, which is the god of Eli, Jah, and that represents the three primary forces that we explain, is precisely in the very beginning of the word or the name of John in Hebrew. Jahanan is the name. Or say Johanan, but there really is Jahanan. That is precisely what it says, the grace, the grace of Jah, or that the outcome of Jah is there incarnated in John. This is how it is hidden in the words. Eli Jah. The God, Jah, Iao, the Trinity, is hidden within Jah, Hanan, John. But in order to become a Jahanan, one needs to create the vehicles 
for this ja or e a o. The three primary forces. We need to create uh, an astral body. We need to create a mental body and a causal body, which in theosophy is called the astral body, the inferior mind or inferior manas, and the causal body is called the superior manas. These are which in Greek is called the famous Tosoma Putchikon. It is written like this P S U C H I K O N Putchikon. Tsuchikon. Tsuchikon. Yeah, it's like psyche. Yeah, exactly. The P uh, in this word is silent. So it's Soma, the Tosoma Tsuchikon. Soma, as you know, in, in Greek means body. And Suk comes from psyche. And Ikon means image. The image of what? The Tosoma Tsuchikon. It's precisely that psychic body or soul body that had to emerge from the waters. The Ikon in Hebrew is called Salem, which means image. In other words, the image of Jah, which is Keter, which is symbolized by the Yod, which means phallus, esoterically speaking, that image is in the seed, in the sexual organs, in Yesod. So from Yesod has to emerge El E Jah. The god Jah, the forces of Eliao, in the different steps, in order for the reincarnation of that Elijah, Eliao, to be in the earth. It could be anyone in the earth. That's the bodhicitta that has to be created. But of course, that bodhicitta emerges before the creation of the mercurial bodies or the astral, mental, and causal bodies. Because that Soma Suchikon is related with Yesod. And it's in Yesod when we start developing the consciousness by taking care of the sexual, of the salim of God, or the icon of God. And this is something that we have to comprehend because when nobody talks about the tosoma suchikon or puchikon, and other, other calls. This is the body of the soul. And here is precisely one uh, passage from the Bible given by this great Kabbalist, Paul of Tarsus, Master Hilarion. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44, 45. It is sown a soul body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a soul body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So we are talking about here the first man, the living soul. The Soma Suchikon that emerges 
from the transmutations of the sexual energy. Because the tree of life is related with that psyche. When we enter into these studies, we have to develop the tree of life. We don't have to follow or to fall, I mean, into the mistake of many organizations that they think that they have already all the tree of life within. No. The only part of that tree of life that we have is the physical body. Because that is the outcome of the tree of knowledge. Anything in this universe is the outcome of that, of the tree of knowledge, of the tree of science, of the two polarities. Whether they express themselves in the human body or in the animal body or in the plant body or in the mineral body, in the universe, in the space. It's over the two forces, the two polarities, positive and negative, in order to create. That is what we call the energy of the Holy Spirit. That expresses in two polarities. So the physical body is the outcome of sex. Nobody can deny that. We were created in the sexual act. Of course, this physical body is a gift that nature gives us. And within, we are, as Hana. That's why when you see the newborn baby in a newborn body, you only see Hana. And this is why this angel, Hanael, is symbolized with an innocent creature. Because this is the only innocent uh, element that we have within, the essence which expresses in the very moment when we are born. This is Hana, that is the essence, that is the Buddha, the part of Buddha that has to grow. But in order for that element to grow into an enlightened being like Buddha, like a prophet, in order to become a Ja Hanan, because Hana, the, 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 the gracious element, is there. But in order for that to become Johanan, you have to know the signs of good and evil, the signs of transmutation. And that is precisely what is hidden in that passage when it says that Elizabeth is praying in order to have a child. That Elizabeth is the monad, the spirit of each one of us, that's one to have a child. That child is have, or has to be made into the image of Elizabeth, which is the monad. So Jahanan is that, is the image of Jah, the gracious of Jah, or the grace of Jah. So when you find there that Johanan John the Baptist appears in the Gospels before the Bodhisattva, not after. Of course, we had to study the sign of Johanan, the sign of Elijah, because we want Eliao, Elijah, to emerge, to search from within our consciousness. In other words, we had to develop our own particular individual Eliao, Elijah. As we had to develop also our own particular Jesus. And of course, Eliao, or incarnated in, in, the, in any man, is Jahanan. And this is precisely the mistake of many uh, people that do not understand the scriptures, that they wanted to see the prophet Elijah again in the same way. But they don't understand that this, that Elijah itself is an eon. An eon that expresses itself in many ways, through many men. Any avatar first develops that Eliao within, which is, I repeat, the solar mind, the bodhicitta, 
the completely developed bodichita, which is always working on the disservice <coughs> of its own particular individual god. So the astral body is a soul body. In many books, many lectures, we explained that we had to create the electronic bodies. Electronic, with electrons, with solar energy. We said solar bodies, electronic bodies. Now we said psychic bodies or soul bodies. That man or that human being that Genesis speaks or talks or refers about is the soul. It's a soul. The physical body is only a vehicle. When people think that man or the human being is made into the image of God, they always refer to the physical body and think, therefore, that God is like us. They don't understand that God has no form. God has no form. Abstract but it takes any form it wishes. The tree of life, which is precisely the being, is represented in the 10 Sephiroth. 10 manifestations through four worlds of that that we call God. That's why we said God is a multiple perfect unity. To grasp this, is to understand yourself. It is easy to see that the physical body is made by many units. You see it as one unit, but has many organs. Each organ is made by many cells, any cell for many molecules, and one molecule for many atoms. And with this integrated atom, we liberate energy. So you see there the multiplicity within one unity, which is physical body. If we think in that way, we understand that God is the same. He's many. But his presence is as one, as three, as seven, as twelve, as twenty-four, Kabbalistically speaking, in different ways. So to have the image of God is not physical. To have that image is to be the microcosmo of the macrocosmo. And that's a bodhicitta. To reflect the universe in your psyche. That is an image of God. Because God is everywhere. But if we think, of course, that God is there, seated in a throne of tyranny in the clouds, of course, if we want to be an image of that idol. That's why with the Gnostics says, when they refer to that God, they say, you believe in God? No, we don't believe in that God. That God doesn't exist. God has no form. We have to understand what God is. It's deluded everywhere. And it is the same absolute. Are we his image or its image? That's the question. And that's precisely what has to emerge first, his image. Is he a con, as we said in Hebrew, uh, I mean in Greek, the Tosoma Suchikong, the soul image of God. This is what we have to, to, to create within. This is what we, the Gnostics, are interested in. To create the image in God within. It doesn't matter of permutation, transmutation. Because what we have within is not the image of God. It is enough to sit down and observe our mind in order to see that it's not El Yao. It's not the bodhicitta there. The bodhicitta is the image of God. And it emerges here in Yesod. And for that, we had to write that soul body in the astral world, which people call astral body. And that many esotericists mistake with the Kamarupa which is the body of desires that any animal can have or any animal has. Above that 
solar soul body in the astral world, we have to create a mental solar body. That mental solar body is also soul body. And that soul body is represented by an angel. According to this uh, book of Daniel, when they state that three men are in the forge, in the fire, that Nebuchadnezzar, I believe it is the king that put them, or the other king, and the fourth appear, a fourth man, like an angel. That is the mental solar body that we have to create. We have to create that angel within. And above that, we create the causal body. That causal body is what the Bible calls, in the Old and New Testament, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the causal body. is the superior mind. Superior mind, we will talk about here, the nous mind, the chitta. So this bodhicitta begins from Yesod and ends in Tifereth with all the creation of all the bodies. Of course, in the past, before these bodies were created, the bodhicitta was already developed. In other words, the masters were demanding from that disciple to awake the consciousness. To have, of course, that bodhicitta completely developed in order to develop in, the, in another level, in another level, in another level, in order to make the yahanang completely done. As an example of this, let me tell you. One example of this uh, bodhicitta developed as a, a, as a seed in order to create more levels. Uh, Yogananda. Yogananda developed that bodhicitta. Mm -hmm. And he was really sacrificing himself for humanity. Unfortunately, he only developed that in Yesod. He didn't go further. Because the whole bodhicitta has to be created in the astral, in the hod, in the sa, and in tiferes, three walls above, to be complete. Of course, but he is ready in order to create the mercurial bodies. In this day and age, since we have no time to wait for the people to awake the bodhicitta, the consciousness, in order to create the mercurial bodies, we are delivering the knowledge in order for them to start creating. And unfortunately, as you know, with this development, if we do not disintegrate, if we don't develop the bodhicitta completely, that hana don't become yahana, but the contrary, hanas mus, which is the contrary. You see the same word there, hana? That gracious element, which is the consciousness, continues bottle up in the moose, which in this case we will take the English uh, explanation for it. The animal aspect of us. This is precisely what you have to see. Hanas moose, yahanang. Always the word hana there, which is the gracious of Jah. Of course, somebody that is being born like that with a mercurial bodies, already created, he has to disintegrate the ego. Because we always talk about, in different lectures, about fallen bodhisattvas. In other words, those beings that became bodhisattvas and fell. And the bodhicitta, the auric embryo, became bottled up within the ego. But let me tell you one thing. When an angel falls and has a bodhicitta already developed and is a bodhisattva, which means a vehicle of chokmah, of Christ, he never loses that bodhicitta. He never loses the em auric embryo because that ne is never lost. That is always there. But 
becomes bottled, trapped within the animal element, within the ego. And that's the problem. And that's why any fallen bodhisattva has always that ability to bring the knowledge because he already did it. He's fallen, but he's already there because the monad already got it. He has to repeat the same. But anybody that begins in this uh, path first, as it's written, has to develop the bodhicitta. That's why it is good that the students start annihilating the ego, developing the consciousness, as Yogananda did. But you don't, do not fall into the mistake that think this is enough. No. Because in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, into the superior parts of the sephiroth, of the tree of life, we need to be born again. And that birth is not by theory or what the people think. By believing in Jesus or by believing what is written in certain scriptures. Nobody is being born like that just by believing if we are in this physical world, it's because our mother and father have a coitus, a sexual act. And from that coitus, the physical body emerges in which we are right now. That is the first part of the tree of life that we have. And from the forces of this physical body, from the sexual force, which is that, the tree of knowledge, we start learning the signs of good and evil the signs of transmutation, the signs of Johanan. And we start baptizing ourselves with that water if we are married. And then, by taking advantage of the sexual force of men and women, we create other bodies inside. But what is created inside is psyche, is soul, is that Adam which is called, the first Adam, a living soul. And that Adam, or living soul, is nurtured always with the tree of knowledge. Because the root of the tree of knowledge is precisely in Yesod. And the beginning of the tree of life is in Yesod. From Yesod emerges Malkut. From the Asadi emerges Hod, Netzah, and all the Sephiroth. And of course, that's why that is here, below Jah. Because when we are reaching the level of uh, Chesed, when through initiation, when through the signs of Jahanan, we transmute the energy seven times, and then we enlighten each one of the seven bodies of the true man. Because the true man is Hesed, with the bodies below. We always state that Johanan or John is a word that could be decomposed in, or, or, or break in seven vowels. E, A, O, U, A, M, S, E, O, M, S. So that's how we, you uh, break the word John, G, O, M, which symbolize, of course, the complete man created. That Salem of God there. Not only in the physical world, but in the vital world, in the astral world, etc. That's why when you study the book of Ezekiel, he talks in the beginning about the four kerub, the four kerubim. 
which in the previous lectures we explained are related with the Sphinx. The crew with the face of an eagle, the crew with the face of a lion, the crew with the face of a bull, and the other crew with the face of a man. When in Kabbalah we place those four groups in the tree of life, we put the first group here, which is the eagle, then the lion and Hod, and its size, the eagle, Hod is the lion, and the bull, of course, is Malkut, but the angel is always in Yesod. And it's precisely very interesting to see that when you talk about the Gospel of Matthew, many painters paint over Matthew writing his Gospels in an angel behind him advising him what to write. Because Matthew, or Mataya, as you said in, in Hebrew, you see over the word Jah there, Mataya, the one who receives from Jah, that's the meaning of Mataya. And that's why it's related with the, with the left part of the brain, Matthew, we said in English. So Mataya is the one that receives from Jah. But how you want to receive from Jah? Only by knowing the, 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 the signs of Yesod. To receive in Hebrew means Kabel, Kabbalah. That's a real Kabbalist, the one that is receiving when he's practicing the knowledge. This is how it is entering. And then you developed that Jahanan within you with the sign of Mataya. So you see how everything is related and given there accordance with the signs in the doctrine of Kabbalah, the language of the Hebrew language. Because the Hebrew language is related with wisdom. If you take advantage, of course, of the signs of good and evil. A Sanskrit is also related with wisdom. All those languages are, is where, where, how the masters hide the meaning of all the doctrines for the bodhicitta. Of course, many people speak Hebrew. Many people speak Sanskrit and all those languages, but they are not wise. You have to understand what we talk about also, the gospel talks about the Jews. For us, the Gnostics, a Jew is somebody that has astral, mental, and causal bodies created within. That's a Jew. Because he's Jew or Jah, Judah, the lion, the solar force. So we, to become a Jew is to become a Buddha, a Buddhist, to become a Christian, a true, true element, a bodhicitta, in other words. That's why the book of Revelation says, those who said they are Jews and lie and are false. Because there are many people who say, well, I am a Jew. No. In order to be a Jew, you have to create all of this. You have to, to emerge from Yasod with the tree of life inside of you. Anybody can memorize the tree of life and all the Kabbalah. But to develop that within, that is another thing. That's a matter of practice. Because this psyche, the bodhicitta, Eliyahu, is someone, someone that delivers himself with a, lot of, with, with a lot of zealous to his being. Seal. The seal, the other word. The seal of Elijah. If you read the story of Elijah, he has a little seal to, towards Jah. See, Elijah means my God is Jah, is Yao, meaning that everything is going inside, not outside. Always towards your psyche, to your, towards your being. 
because you want to become a vehicle of the Lord. But in order for the Lord to descend, in order to Messiah, the Messiah to enter into your body, Elijah has to come first. And this is precisely what many students, esotericists, miss. And this is not like, oh, I'm going to believe in John the Baptist first and then in Jesus. No. It's to practice the science of John the Baptist. John the Baptist has, is, this, is the one that suffered the decapitation. That's why in, in, in Gnosticism we call about the Buddhist annihilation or the Buddhist decapitation. This decapitation of John the Baptist has to be suffered for, uh, for us seven times. Every time that the energy of the Kundalini, the fire of the Holy Ghost passes through the neck, and any initiation, the initiate internally suffers the decapitation of John the Baptist. That means that he leaving his mundane mind to the world and entering and develop Elial, Elijah, within. So seven times you have to be decapitated internally, symbolically, in order to become a bodhicitta, to develop that. And this is how you understand that is written in the book, uh, the book of uh, Luke, that after six months, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary. But John was already there in the womb of Elizabeth. And this is uh, very symbolic. It's not that six literal months. Six is the arcanum, six. The arcanum of indecision. That human soul, that psyche, which in the beginning is sank into animal elements and is between the virgin and the whore. And we explain in other lectures that that vision of that whore is precisely the way in which we manage our physical body. When we enter into these studies, we discover that our own matter, our own matter is sinful. It's a whore, in other words. It's polluted. We are children of fornication. And obviously, we are with our sight towards the whore, to our own sins, desires, in this physical malkut, which represents the matter, because malkut is represented by a feminine aspect. So we have to turn the face towards the other side. And that's little by little by learning how to be in chastity in the world of the Assad, how to transform this matter into a virgin. It doesn't matter if you are man or woman, you have to become virgin. Virgin means that you have to be in chastity, you have to transform, you have to know how to handle the forces of your physical body. In order for that virgin to give birth the Messiah, but that process, that permutation of the whore into virgin is a process of transmutation in Yesod and the creation of the psychic body or bodies within. And that's why when that body is already done, when, when Elijah is already there, when Jahanan that could be Peter, could be John, could be uh, Joseph, doesn't matter what name we have in this physical world, that Jahanan has to emerge from within. That's why symbolically, anybody that reaches that level, he receives the name of John. But there is also a, a master called Johanan, but we are not talking about him. We are pushing all the masters aside and says, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, master, but now we have to deal with us. You exist, we venerate you, but we have to deal now with what you left here, what we taught us in the past. So that is Johanan. 
Johanan came 2,000 years ago, appeared, yeah, to symbolize, to represent what we are spending here. But if you realize there is more, because it's not simple like that, right? It's half a lot, but in order to explain the whole work of Johanan, we had to write many books. So it's just Kabbalistically written with the abstract mind in order for you to comprehend and to understand. So, are you following me? This is precisely what we have to understand. The Borichita, biblically speaking, is Elijah. That has to appear first in order to prepare the way of the Lord, which is that aspect that enters, that light that enters, and that we explain in the epiphany of Christ in the beginning how it is related with Malkut. But that energy rises in the physical body, the energy of the Messiah. It is because Johanan is already created. The energy of the Savior the energy of the energy of Chokhmah, the body, cannot develop in the sattva if that is not developed. That sattva, we will say in synthesis, is the bodhicitta. So then, the energy appears in the physical world, and this is how the bodhicitta starts knowing about the subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, in order to know the abyss. Because here you find Malkut. When the, bo uh, when, when the child God, when the Messiah is being born in Malkut, is in the Malkut of that Borichita, in the physical body of that Johanan, that is already a full, complete man into the image of God. Then, the entrance of the Messiah into the physical body delivers to him the mystery of Klipoth, the mystery of the abyss. Because within our own particular Malkut, which is the physical body, we have hell. That hell or inferno is the inferior dimensions, which is subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, what people call sins, karma and all of that that we have within, that we have to know, that we have to study, that we have to comprehend. That's the mystery of the abyss and how from the abyss emerges a God. As Nietzsche said, there is where we learn how to make a God with our good and evil, with our seven demons. Because everyone has those demons within, the seven capital sins, in other words. We have to make a God with it. But it's a permutation that we have to do a transformation. This is how <coughs> the forgiver, the one that forgives sins, enters into us. Christ only enters into us in order to forgive the sins or the karma of the world, of this world, which is Jahanan, if he's created. The Messiah cannot enter into anybody that does not have the Solar bodies created, already created. We need to create them. This is how you have to see and comprehend why Johanan is created before than the Messiah. How he is being born before than the Messiah. And how he appears first before the multitudes, before the Messiah. Because this is what the, the first thing. Then appears the, the Johanan, the man created already there with the bodies, already in front of the multitudes, teaching the same thing. In the same way that he emerged, that he was born, he teaches again, you have to be born again. And don't say that you are children of Abraham, he says, or children of Brahma. Because God can make children from these stones. I'm talking about the philosophical stone of Yasor, of course. From this same sexual force, God can create more children. Therefore, he who is not in chastity, 
will be cut and cast into the fire. That's a great symbol. Of course, for those that are asking for the knowledge, that wants to enter into the path. And then appears Jesus for the first time. But if he is coming from where? From Nazareth. And if you read the gospel, you will see that this Jesus that was born in Bethlehem and that descends and to rise in the physical body as a serpent of light reaches the root of the nose when that kundalini of light, not kundalini of fire, because the kundalini of fire creates solar bodies. The kundalini of light awakens the man which is created. That's the duty of Chochmah. So when that light in the physical body reaches the root of the nose, and then you find there Inri, which means Jesus Nazarenus from Nazar, which means nose, with which in here, Rex Iudaorum in Latin. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's the meaning. When this king of the Jews, it doesn't mean that this king of, of those people that live in the Middle East, in Israel. No. It means king of those that are being born from the solar force. Because the one that created that man was him, the solar energy. But now he's descending in another level, another octave. And that's why when he's reaching there, he says, well, Jesus Nazar of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. Inri. And then he appears. Already manifesting himself, that solar light that is cosmic, which is multiple and diluted in the universe, became and is manifesting through that man into the physical world and entering into another octave. That's why when John sees Jesus coming to him, he's not uh, literally seeing it in the physical world, no, inside of him. He says, Lord, you come to me to be baptized and I need to be baptized by you. And then the Lord says, let it be done in this way, because this, this is the way that has to be accomplished. I come to you in Yesod. Because here is where we had to develop, or I had to be developed, through your action, through your sexual alchemy, through your sexual transmutation in this level, I have to emerge within you. You realize that? So Jesus Christ emerges from Johanan within. First appears, it's a development of the psyche inside. This is what is called the quickening spirit, the second man inside. And this is happening in every master. The duality of the bodhicitta and the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva in this case is Jesus, and the bodhicitta is John the Baptist. He enters and develops inside. But if you read the gospel, it says that he, Jesus, is coming from Nazareth, from the nose, the root of the nose, which is the first initiation of the light. And from there descends into Yesod in order to start another initiation of the light, which is related with these mysteries that we are talking right now. Behold, when he appears as a 30-year-old man, 
But the Bible says that the last time that he appears, according to the gospel, is when he was 12. So there is a big gap between 12 to 30. And if you observe Kabbalistically, you find 18 years missed. Not by casualty or by accident. It's because 18 means, re it's referring to the occult enemies that everybody has within. Those occult enemies are the animalistic elements that we have to disintegrate and you have to deal with. And those elements are related with klipoth. The 18 is in relation with klipoth. That's why in that uh, time, when Jesus is from 12 to 30, disappears. He's dealing in Klippoth, knowing himself, related with Klippoth. If you make the addition of 8 and 1, you have 9. And then you have, again, the ninth sphere. So he's working, of course, in the ninth sphere. There, in Klippoth, knowing his own enemies, his own Defect, vices, and errors. And when he reaches that level, as a bodhisattva, he comes to John again, which is the physical body of that uh, master that has to develop him inside. And as that, he receives the baptism. And from the waters is written... Jesus emerges from the waters, emerges. That's the meaning of the solar force emerging, or the light emerging in the spinal column of that uh, initiate. And receives the Holy Spirit, the force of understanding, the force of comprehension, to the transmutation, to the chastity, because he was already, or, or the matter is already virgin, chaste. And it's written that after he receives that force of the Holy Spirit and all the mysteries of the signs of good and evil and the tree of life, before appearing to the multitudes and delivering the message, he has to confront the devil. He has to confront Satan, Lucifer. He has to have the sign, the signature of Lucifer, say, okay, you are ready, go. Otherwise, he doesn't go. So that's why he's taken into the wilderness, being tested, by Lucifer, Satan, or the devil, whatever you want to call him. Who is this? Why does Jesus need first to be tested in order to appear and to start as the Messiah? Every master has to pass through that test. That Lucifer walks through the mind of the ancient. You see, whether it's a protoplasmic mind Negative, lunar, or solar. Lucifer is the one that temper that master through his temptations. Because in Yesod, which is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, is where Lucifer abides. Lucifer is a sexual potency. Is that fire that gives knowledge? you take advantage of it. Of course, in the beginning of Genesis, as you know, Lucifer appears in the tree of knowledge and tempted Eve, but Eve was naive. Bites the fruit and falls from Yesod and enters into Malkut failure. And this humanity is that, is the outcome of temptation, failure. But a master, in order to go ahead into the higher Sephirah, he has to defeat Lucifer first. And that's a process of the development of the bodhicitta. And where is that Lucifer? 
with, within the body of Johanan. That Lucifer is related, or that Satan is related with Herod, with Herodias, with Salome, is related with Pilate. That Lucifer is related with Caiaphas, with Judas, and with all of those elements that we have within. This is how the legion of the angels of Lucifer are behind him. You have to defeat one by one. And it's synthesized, of course, and the three temptations in which you have to know how to defeat your own particular individual Lucifer. And he goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Kabbalistically, 40 is Mem. Mem, Mame, the waters of baptism. In other words, within the waters of Mem is how you control and you manage to defeat the temptations of Satan, which represents, in this case, the sensual mind. That mind related with Malkut. If you are, he says, to the Bodhisattva, if you are the son of God, make these stones bread and eat them. When you study esotericism, you understand that the bread is a symbol of that super substantial understanding or energy that comes from above and which your soul nourishes. That's why the word Bethlehem, the house of the bread, is the house of wisdom. When the, you are <coughs> facing the devil, the devil always push you to the senses, to the sensual knowledge. the stones of Malkut. To the physical body, you receive knowledge. If you are the son of God, make this stone, this, this sensual impressions that you receive from your, through your five senses, make it bread. Nourish yourself with that. But if you identify, if you become identified with the sensual impressions of this physical world, you forget about your God. This is what people, many people do. They are identified with theories, with dogmas, with beliefs. That's precisely the stones. Make these stones to become bread inside of you, become wisdom. And then Jesus answered, it is written, the man shall not live by bread alone. By, by every word that comes from the word of God. It means you go inside of yourself. And the real wisdom comes from inside, from above. From the superior sephiroth. But Satan is in your thought pointing at Malkut. Make this to transform in wisdom. He says no. Not only from that. So when you enter into this uh, path, yeah, you have to transform your impressions. You have to know about this world. But remember that the wisdom also comes from above, from the superior sephiroth. And you have to do the effort in order to experience that. That's why in Buddhism, they teach how to meditate, to have samadhis, ecstasies, satoris, and when to bring also that, you have to sit down and meditate and bring the wisdom from above. Not only here. If we start talking here about only theories, we will fall in the mistake, as many Christians believe, that by believing in what is written in the Bible, is done, and, and you are saved. And Jesus forgive all your sins just by reading that. Very funny, very silly. 
because the wisdom comes from above and you have to awake your senses, your inner senses, in order to hear the word of God. You know what is the word of God? The word of God is the word or the voice of the silence. In other words, <clears throat> when you say, Satan, shut up. You, mind, that talk too much, give me many theories, many sophisms. Shut up. Be quiet. I want to hear the voice of God. And when the mind is in silence, when the mind is quiet, then the satori enters. Samari. And then comes the word, the wisdom of God. And that's what feeds the inner man, the psychic man, the soul man. This is, what, this is how it is developed. But Satan will always push you to outside, to the five senses. And when he's defeated, he comes again. He doesn't give up very easily. And read what he says in the second temptation. You have it read it here. Let me read it for you. Then the devil, which is you and everybody, take him into the holy city and seated him on the pineal gland. You see, the holy city is your body. Pineal gland related with the superior body. The pinnacle of the temple, which is the head. And said unto him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Of course, the Lord, the Messiah, has the power to deal with our own karma, Zaya, karma of adultery, karma of fornication. Being up there, he has to know how to deal with it. And when that thing appears, the stone is the philosophical stone of Yesod. So cast thyself. Go ahead. You know, it's like tame adultery. And then he's, he says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. This is the answer of Jesus. In other words, the Bodhisattva only obeys the commands of the inner being. If the inner being tells him, do this, do that, in the world of your thought, to defeat this karmazaya, this karmaduro, he will do it. Because he is under the commands of his own being. This is what is a bodhicitta and bodhisattva combined. For us, which are still in this level, we have to follow the commandments, the Ten Commandments and all the rules that are written, because we are blind. Once we awaken, we reach that level, those commandments are not for you. You have to com receive directly commands from your inner being, because he has to manage good and evil. And this is something that people do not understand. At that level, any initiate does things that maybe are contradicting what is written, that they will turn on you. Of the Deuteronomy, the written law, which is the second law. The first law is what take over the Bodhisattva. But only if the being commands. But of course, since it's written, many, many laws of this Deuteronomy or this first law is written in the Gospels, not only in the Hebrew Bible and other scriptures. So your mind, Satan, will tell you, well, it is written that you can do this. Throw yourself. Go ahead. It says, it says, Satan, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. You have not to do anything by yourself. And if, if you follow what Satan is telling you, you will lose. That is in relation with sexuality. To fall. Then again the devil take him up into the exceeding high mountain. 
the mountain of initiation. And show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and identify with the sensual world. And worship me, the mind. You realize that? You fall down and you identify with the sensual world. You worship me. This Malkut, this kingdom, is created by the mind. All of this society, this civilization, is created by the intellectuals. See the internet, TV, radio, inventions, all the technology that we find here is created by the mind. Satan. It's all only concerned with the matter, the material mind. At that level, you have powers, you have the way to know how to handle the forces of the world through your mind. Many initiates, when they reach uh, mastery, immediately, the first thing that they do is, <coughs> my second name is this, follow me. And they like to have a lot of followers behind them. They like to be worshipped. In other words, that Satan is taking over them. They didn't defeat this, uh, this uh, test, this or, or, uh, temptation. When you are worshipping somebody, it's because that body is also worshipping himself. That's wrong. And that's why Jesus said unto the mind, his own mind, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. Absurd will be that God, already there and developed in the Bodhisattva, will worship the mind. You see the Buddha? The Buddha is always seated with a bowl in his hand. And the bowl is facing up. Meaning that he is receiving the commands. He's worshiping the interior being in order to become illuminated. He's a servant, a bodhisattva of the Lord. But his mind and any mind of any master will always say, hey, turn down that bowl. Forget about God. Turn down and worship me. That's the meaning of that. To turn your psyche towards the senses, the sensual senses, and forget about the spirit. Right? Make business with religion. Have money. Be, uh, I mean, on the earth. And that's why it's written by the Master Samuel on Beor that was Yahweh, the one that tempted Jesus, physically speaking, at that time. Because Yahweh is the one that is the boss of the Black Lodge. And this Yahweh is uh, cunningly mixed or confused with the Lord Jehovah. But the Lord Jehovah is one thing. Jehovah is one thing and Yahweh is another. Yahweh is a boss, is a demon of the Black Lodge that tempted Jesus and said, all the kingdoms of the world I will give you because he is the boss and the Black Lodge controls the whole planet. He will worship me and kneel before me. But let me tell you, that demon is represented in our own mind. That's our own particular Satan. And that temptation will always come to uh, to us. So that's why in Buddhism there is no worship of anything. You have to awake your inner Buddha. You have to defeat Mara and his daughters within in order to, for the Bodhicitta to strengthen within you and the Lord to do 
the word, the work that he has to do. And that is what is written in the Gospels. The path of the Bodhisattva. That temptation that happened to Jesus, that is written there, happened to him, happened to Moses, happened to all the masters, all the prophets, and will happen to us if we enter into this path. We have to deal with the mind. Remember, Satan represents the mind. Our concrete mind. Nor Eliyahu, because Eliyahu, Elijah, is a solar mind. It's different. It's that mind that his zeal is always to follow his inner God. If you read the story of Elijah, you will see how he is always obeying God. He has a great zeal towards God. But we have inside Satan which we have to control. And as Jesus says, it is written, you will obey and serve God. And this is precisely what we have to do. To use the mind for God. Every time that the mind tells you something which is contrary to the path of the Bodhisattva, and then you said, mind, you have to serve me. You have to obey my inner God. I don't have to serve you. I don't care about your theories, your sophisms, about your beliefs. What I care is only about my inner God. And you have to serve me. Because I will utilize you as this is written. You have to serve. The, the, The mind is an instrument that we have to utilize. You know? The mind is that donkey that you have to sit down and to enter into Jerusalem. Unfortunately, in this day and age, all people are serfs of the mind. They are slaves of the mind, of the Pharaoh, that is written in the book of Exodus. Do you have questions? Yeah. We have to defeat temptation. We always state that temptation is fire and the triumph over temptation is light. But temptation always comes through the mind. Remember that the mind works with the five senses, the sensual mind. And we always have to deal with this sensual mind every time. Every day. In other lectures, I explain to you that we, we have to resolve an equation when we are being born, we are being into this universe. A big equation. That equation is divided in two parts. Half of the equation is related with the dealing of this world. We have to know, or we have to have a job in order to make money in this planet, because with money, we have to pay house, we have to pay our shelter, we have to have clothing, we have to buy clothes with money. And uh, we have to eat. So we have to be concerned with that, because we'll be stupid if we are saying, oh, no, 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 money is uh, vain. We don't want it. No, we need it. But we don't have to be a slave of money. But Satan utilizes money. And a lot of people that have enough already, but they want to be millionaires. They want to be billionaires. And when they are billionaires, they don't know even what to do with their millions and billions. You know what I mean? You need money. You need to survive. You need to resolve the first half of the equation. Of course, everybody has to do it the best you can. But the other half is precisely this, to develop that within Because if the purpose of life is to come into this world and to become a millionaire, a billionaire, that is so silly. Why do I have to be born just like that? Or just because we have to invent or or, or this, have to evolve or, or something like that. 
We have to develop, yeah, inside. That is the second part of the equation, but nobody cares about the second part of the equation. Everybody's identified with the first part, and is where the society is. And of course, when we enter into this path, that far, the first part of the equation is a big gymnasium, in which you know how to take advantage in order to develop the second half of the equation. In your job, in your home, everywhere, you always find people that mock you, that do not care about this path, and you have to learn and have to find a way in order to take advantage of that, of those temptations, because Lucifer, Satan, is tempting you all the, all the time. You had to be free. You had to defeat him. Rare are those that completely defeat Lucifer, because the great temptation of Lucifer is sexual. Yeah, you can defeat if somebody's insulting you. You, are, you control your anger. Yeah, easy. But a sexual temptation. Or to be in the very sexual act and to avoid the spasm, the orgasm of the animals, that's a, def a, a defeat to Satan, to Lucifer. But you have to do that every day or every time that you perform sexual act. Every time that you are in a sexual act, Lucifer is there. Okay, defeat me again. You defeat me yesterday, I want to be defeated today. And he will fight. He will utilize one of his angels, black angels. What is a black angel? Well, lust. Many defects and vices of lust that you have within. He will utilize them in order to make you fall. What is to fall? To ejaculate the sexual matter. Then you become slave of Lucifer or Satan. That's why men, 40 days in the wilderness, to fight, to work a lot. Or 40 years, no, 40 days as well, right? In the Ark of Noah. And 40 years in the wilderness as well, the Israel. That 40 is always related with men. The way in which you have to defeat different ordeals all the time. And every time it's more subtle and subtle and subtle until you reach the level of job. Any other question? Yeah, the question is, when a bodhisattva falls, does he maintain his bodies? Yeah, of course. Any fallen bodhisattva already created the astral, mental, and causal bodies. All the solar bodies are within. When he falls, all the bodies got with him. But being a violent ego, doesn't he, doesn't he bust? Yeah, doesn't he bust? That, that, that's the problem. That now is a, is a mixture. It's what we call a hanasmus. Somebody that has the divine within and also the devil within. But a fallen angel, a fallen bodhisattva can rise again with work. Hmm? So doesn't he have to perform alchemy again? Or? Oh yeah, of course. He has to do the work again in the same way and harder. Because when a bodhisattva falls, the ego emerges. Satan emerges again within him. And that Satan is in the same level. Not in the same level that you defeated in the beginning. That will be easy, right? No. Now Satan is like, uh -uh. now I have more energy and more force. Then we will see you defeat me again right now. And that's why in this universe, there are bodhisattvas that do the work seven times. Beyond that is too much. Jesus of Nazareth did the work seven times. That's why it's always admired, a, a being like that, that defeated Lucifer seven times in the process, of course. And of course, when one is fall, I mean fallen, when the Bodhisattva falls, the auric embryo becomes bottled at with an ego. It is a mixture. You know, that's why the Master Samael on the or states, a fallen bodhisattva is worse than a demon because that ego is bottled up, the embryo is bottled up into the, of, of negativity. And he knows how to do things worse. Uh, that's why those that are fallen have to be careful in order not to talk too much. But it's always forgiveness if the Lord wants to forgive you. 
You have another question? Yeah? Can you elaborate on what you just mentioned about the main skills to become the CEO but not actually like before you go into the program or something? It means that after you defeated Lucifer completely in all yourself and you don't have ego at all, then you have to be tested at the end and you to see if really you don't have any ego and if really you defeated him. So you have to qualify. And the one that gives you that qualification is again Lucifer. Under the commands of the inner God of that master. So appears well, this is what the book of Joseph says. What do you think about my third job? This is how the bodhicitta, is a bodhisattva, is really perfect. It is, it is good, right? He says, mm, just give me permission to bother him and to see if really he respects you and it really is giving his all consciousness and all, all that to you. And then uh, the God says, okay, he is in your hands, but don't kill him. Don't treat him bad. You're just ruining his life right now. And he goes and ruins his life, you know, the book of Job. And after that, he comes again, and, and, and God says, well, you see, I told you he's perfect. He didn't blaspheme. He has no ego. He, he, he's, he's ready for resurrection. Well, says Satan, if you take everything that a man has, men will give everything for his life. But if you allow me now to touch his physical body and to put him a very sickening thing, a, a sickness, you will see how he will blaspheme in your face. And as, uh, the Lord says, okay, you, I had to receive the okay from you in order to resurrect this guy. So go ahead, just not treat him very badly. Okay, okay. And then comes, you know, and the, this is the story with every single master. Receive a sickness. And he has to endure it. He has not to protest. Because Satan is applying, of course, katansia, karmasaya, kamadura, according to the law. He's obeying God. And if the Bodhisattva trumps, resurrects. And then Lucifer goes and says, okay, and now am I, I now am your servant. Do whatever you want. What do you want me to do for you? Hmm? But after resurrection, before that, Lucifer is just tempting you. But if you defeat him, he will, he will be like Faust. You know Faust? He was transforming his own Lucifer into a horse and a stallion. He was traveling in the fourth dimension with him. But that is a resurrected master. There's a, another level. So we are talking about this in steps. And that's precisely the great ordeal of Job, which is applied to the Bodhisattva at the end, before resurrection. If you don't have any other question, do you have it? Thank you very much. And see you in the next lecture, which is going to go a little bit above Yesod. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.